Hi, this is Craig from MBS History, and this is my review of the film The Last of the Mohicans. I'm also doing this in collaboration with History Clarified, and if you'd like to go to his channel over here, give a like and subscribe to him. He'll be doing the better half of the second part, while I'll be doing more of the beginning, but we do overlap, and we're giving very different perspectives. I myself live in Quebec, Canada, and I happen to work on a native reserve. So this movie is actually quite close to heart because most of the members of my reserve actually had parts in this film. So please, without further ado, watch our review. And so, The Last of the Mohicans is a film directed by Michael Mann, starring Daniel Day-Lewis, Medellin Stowe, Wes Studi, Russell Means, Eric Schweig, Jody May, Maurice Roves, and Stephen Waddington. It is based upon the novel of the same name written by James Fenimore, Cooper, first published in 1826. The plot of the film involves members of a dying Native American tribe, the Mohicans, whom still exist to this day. They are Hawkeye, Uncas, and Shingachguk, who rescued the daughters of a British colonel during the French-Indian War, and run into conflict with the French and their native allies. So let me give a bit of some background. The French-Indian War of 1754 to 1763 pitted the British colonies against Nouvelle-France, whom both had native allies. I simply can't dwell too far into who all these native allies were, because there's a long list of them, but I'll try to refer to them as the film does, and it's in the terms of the Iroquois Confederacy with the British, and the Wabanaki Confederacy with Nouvelle-France. The film simplifies this more so, as the three Mohicans on the side of the British against more or less some Hurons with the French. Now before I get into the historic review, I have to mention something that honestly surprised me. It turns out the native reserve I work in had a huge part in making this film. I don't want to give too much information, but I live in Quebec and it's a Mohawk reserve. One of the chiefs in the film was a real Mohawk chief where I am. His name is Mike Cananaguero Phillips. And two women here also wrote most of the dialogue found in the film for the natives. I bring this up because the issue of language is very important to this film. The Mohawk and Huron languages are not natively spoken anymore, and thus the languages they actually speak in this film are Lenape, Delaware for the Mohicans, and Cherokee and Gananagea for the Huron. This was of great interest to me as I deal with Gananagea on a daily basis. And unfortunately, no, I am not fluent in Gananagea. I speak a little more than a few phrases. So I go, Yonkiats, Craig. No way. Well, that's the limit of my abilities. I do happen to speak French, and I will make a few remarks later on in the review about this. Okay, so here we are at the beginning, showing the epilogue, stating that it's 1757, and that is the third year of the war during the French-Indian War. Our three men are the factitious figures Hawkeye, a frontier settler turned orphan, his adoptive father, Chinkakuk, and his adoptive brother, Uncas. And so now we see the three hunting. Hawkeye is using a Pennsylvania flintlock rifle. This long rifle was actually called by the German Jago rifle, which eventually evolved into the Pennsylvania rifle. Slit adjustments were made, such as the lengthening of the barrel and the slimming of the stock in some 40 cal. Once they made their kill, they speak, which I assume to be Lenepe or Delaware. Unfortunately, my knowledge is limited of this. I only understand a little bit of Ganegea, which is spoken more or less by the Hurons in this film. So then we see the Mohicans meet up with the Cameroon family, colonial settlers and friends of theirs. The Mohicans explain that they've been trading furs at Schulerville, which was named after the victorious General Schuler at the Battle of Saratoga in 1779. So as you remember correctly from the beginning of the film, which is supposedly supposed to take place in 1757, this doesn't really add up. But anyways, this is a historic review, so I am going to nitpick here and there. So, they mention how the Dutch trade silver for furs, but the French and English would rather trade wampum or brandy. For those who don't know, wampum was used by various tribes, such as the Iroquois, as credentials, certification of authority, for religious ceremonies, and for diplomacy. However, what is also important is it was used as a currency because of the shiny beads, ornaments, and shells that were imbued into it. You see, before Europeans came to the Americas, a vast trade network existed using items such as these. Research has found shells from Florida ending up as far as the Hudson Bay. There is a misunderstanding even today that the natives simply sold their land for a few beads. This is an ignorant statement. 
based on an evolving economy, certain items like beads could have fetched other trade goods from various tribes. They were simply not taking anything for the value of it being just a shiny object. There was underlying rationales behind all this. It was an interesting economy and was a lot more complex than one would believe. But anyways, I don't have enough time to explain the full uh, trade network of the Aboriginal tribes prior to European arrival. We now see a red coat officer demanding local militia, i.e. colonial settlers, to help with the war effort against France. You hear in the distance, Twin River, Mohawk, have no quarrel with les Francais. Trade furs with les Francais. Now les Francais bring Huron onto Mohawk hunting grounds. Here we get some history. The natives at this time were fighting wars for their own interests. They were fighting for hunting grounds, which obviously were becoming more scarce as Europeans expanded, pushing tribes into another. The natives' perspective is, of, is often overlooked, as they held very real interests. For example, the Iroquois, Mohawks, were arguing that the Iowa area was their land, and if they were British subjects, then they had legal title of it. However, the French initially were winning this war, and the Iroquois were not stupid and feared losing grounds to their French native allies. Thus, the Iroquois did not really enter the war much until the British had turned the war around, and then they officially joined in 1758. Now as for the settler militia, they are asked to participate in the war, but they demand the right to leave and defend their farms and families if the French and or natives raid them. Understand, during this time, Nouvelle France expands through the middle of what is the USA today, destabilizing tribes and pushing them closer to the frontier settlements, making it very dangerous. In the film, the British officer tells them, of course, they'll be able to leave and protect their land, almost brushing it off. Later, this is interpreted to be a lie, which is a looming theme in this film. I believe Jake C. will cover more so the aspects revolving around these grievances that led to the American Revolution will be uncovered. Now, being said, we see a native game of lacrosse in this scene, which is really interesting, and uh, it looks pretty violent. But now we are introduced to the film's antagonist, Magua, or Huron. We find out later that he is sort of a secret agent, pretending to be an ally to the British while secretly working with the French. He is played by Wes Duty, a Cherokee actor and Vietnam War vet. He speaks fluent Cherokee, and thus during the film, most of his Huron dialogue is actually Cherokee. But he also speaks Ganagea, which was written by the woman from the reserve I work on. I uh, read into an interview in which he said that he had to speak it phonetically, as well as his, as his French lines, because in all reality, he doesn't speak either language, as he speaks English and Cherokee fluently. We are also introduced to two sisters, Cora and Alice Monroe. They are the daughters of the real figure, Colonel Monroe, whom we will meet later. Now, while Monroe existed, note he did not have two daughters named Cora and Alice. Of course, being Hollywood, Cora ends up being the romantic interest to Hawkeye, Daniel Day-Lewis in this film. And this thwarts the attempts of some poor British officer named Duncan, who really comes off as a loser during this entire film. Now, finally, our first action scene. A dispatch is given to the British, ordering the march of the 60th Regiment to Fort Edward, while the 35th Regiment is of the foot is to serve at Fort William Henry. Our new antagonist, Magua, is sent to be a scout for the 35th Regiment on its march to Fort William Henry. But as we will see, he has deceived everyone, and there is an ambush. Now, because this is a historic review, I have to point something out. Here in this film is 1757. This would be two years after the famous Braddock expedition disaster occurred. For those unfamiliar, this was when Major General Braddock, accompanied by a certain George Washington, led an expedition to take Fort Duquesne, but were ambushed by French regulars, militia, and natives. They were completely routed, and they stood in their military lines being picked off from the forest and 1,000 British soldiers were killed or wounded. By 1757, the British learnt a hard lesson and adapted to guerrilla warfare. Light infantry companies were developed as a result, and colonial rangers were trained in woodland warfare. In our film, the British soldiers look more so like Braddock's troops, complete morons in a single formation, getting pelted with arrows and gunfire from the forest. This does not make a lot of sense. But uh, I am nitpicking here. It is obvious redcoats need to look stupid in American films. Just watch the film The Patriot for more of that fun. 
Now our brave Mohicans have been tracking the war party down, and they come just in time to rescue the British. Well, two of the women and Duncan, that is. Now I want to point out the weapon that is shown clubbing and being thrown at people by Chinkaguk is a gunstock war club used by many North American tribes during this time period, particularly by Eastern Woodland tribes. The British are using the brown vest musket, as is Magua, and might I add the French later on in the film, I guess they ran out of guns, because the French should be using the Charleville musket, but I do digress. So now the Mohicans will help Cora, Alice, and Duncan get to Fort William Henry. This also leads to the romance between Hawkeye and Cora, I keep picturing the Marvel character when I say this, but uh, no, our Hawkeye is more relevant. They all come back to the Cameron's family farm, where, would you look at it, everyone's been brutally murdered and it's been razed to the ground. The culprits, of course, are the French and Huron raiding parties, the settlers had showed concern for before in the film, setting up more for this grievance narrative towards the American Revolution. Now, the actual history supports this. Indeed, during 1756 to 1757, the French were encouraging their native allies to raid frontier settlements in the Iowa Valley. This led to ongoing alarm for the militiamen, and many streamed back to protect their land, thwarting the war effort. Now, this is where I have a bone to pick with this film. These raids were pushed by colonial French Canadians, particularly by Gouverneur Vaudreuil of Nouvelle France. However, Vaudreuil is not in this film. The military leader that we see in this film is the Marquis de Montcalm de saint venet Montcalm, as I will speak later on in this film, on occasion is shown to be a man pushing the natives to do these attacks, which is hilariously opposite of what the history would portray. Montcalm, in reality, was an uptight aristocrat who saw himself above the colonials, and certainly more so than the natives. His relationship to Vaudreuil is actually well documented, part of Quebec history and they notoriously hated each other. Montcalm saw the colonial use of natives and war tactics as dishonorable, and to be frank, primitive and barbaric. Here are some quotes from Montcalm to prove a point. Les méthodes coloniales ont fait le temps et la guerre à maintenant été établie à la façon européenne, avec campagne, planifie, armée, artillerie, siège, bataille. Now a little piece of Montcalm speaking to the delegation of native allies after the victory at Cadaran. Vous êtes venu à un moment où je n'ai plus besoin de vous. Êtes-vous seulement venu voir des cadavres? Allez derrière le fort et vous les trouverez. Je n'ai pas besoin de vous pour vaincre les Anglais. To give a little bit of background, Montcalm refers to colonial warfare as raiding, scalping, cruelty, and everything at the time he deemed ungentlemanly. For Montcalm, war was honorable, and keeping one's honor was of grave importance. This will be over-exaggerated when we see Montcalm's performance asking the British to surrender, which he was most famous for. It's important to note, Montcalm was disgusted with how the native scalped took prisoners and performed their version of warfare so much, after instances of seeing it, he pretty much tried to never incorporate them into his war as a result. Now that the party has left the raided Cameron family farm, they find themselves at Fort William Henry, which is currently being sieged by the French and their native allies. The siege scenes are quite fantastic and very accurate. The actual siege began on August the 3rd, 1757, and Montcalm's forces were around 7,500, a mix of regular soldiers, militiamen, and the native allies, while Fort William Henry was defended by a garrison of about 2,000. From the trenches to the use of cannons, it's very impressive how in-depth they were to depict the scene. There is one thing I'd like to nitpick, however. The one British soldier shoots a red flare into the night sky. While this was a popular British tactic in the 1790s and onwards, particularly seen in the war in India, this invention came about after the events of the film. Specifically, the rocket flare, I believe, which is being shown in this film, would have been created in 1804 by Colonel Congrave, thus making it not possible for this time period. Regardless now, our party meets Colonel Monroe, who is happy to finally see his daughters. Monroe then demands to know where his reinforcements are, because he had sent couriers to General Webb in Albany. Duncan responds that Webb had marched to Fort Edward two days prior, but has no idea that Fort William Henry is under attack, thus is not sending reinforcements. 
Now, the real history is not the same, unfortunately. In reality, Fort Edward is 15 miles away and not in Albany, mind you. Anyways, you could probably hear the cannon fire from Fort William Henry at Fort Edward. Monroe did petition Webb for help multiple times. However, Webb was not able to give up any troops as he required them for his own fort's protection. And to be honest, I read a few military papers and he seemed like a very skittish military mind, so I don't think he was willing to help. Uh, Webb did send a letter to Monroe to explain this, but it was intercepted by Montcalm's forces, which is shown in the film somewhat. Montcalm used the letter to force the surrender of Monroe, proving his situation was too dire. So Hawkeye now tells Monroe about Cameron's cabin being raided by the French and Huron war parties, to which Monroe replies, I? So? Yet again, implying the British do not care for the colonial settlers, adding more grievance for the American Revolution narrative. I think because the majority of my viewers are obviously American, it might be interesting to tell you something about Nouvelle France and how history taught in Quebec is similar to yours. Here, there is an idea perpetuated very often that Montcalm notoriously hated the French colonists, and he saw them as underneath himself and you know, French nobles were just superior. This often reminds me how American colonists are described and their grievances against the British, which led to the revolution. And uh, yes, I've taken quite a lot of American history courses I know thoroughly about the American Revolution. Anyways, I just wanted to say that in Quebec history, they often glorify Gouverneur Vaudreuil in Quebec history because he's of the colonialists, similar to kind of uh, George Washington, for example, even though he's arguably the person that lost Nouvelle France to the British in the first place. But I digress. It just goes to show the similarity between the American settlers and the French settlers and how they were viewed by the authoritative figures, respectively, in France and Britain, and how it led to a revolution, a revolution in America and, well, Quebec never got there because it got conquered. So now we are finally introduced to La Marquis de Montcalm de saint ferin who is played by Patrice Chéreau. I actually found some interesting interview information from West Duty, who said that during the filming, uh, Patrice spoke almost no English, thus he had phonetically say all of his lines. And I bring this up because ironically West Duty spoke no French, nor Gan so he had to phonetically speak all his lines as well. And boy oh boy, when West Duty speaks French at the end of the film, <laughs> uh, mind you, kudos to both actors. I can attest it's not easy to speak foreign languages. Just watch any of my attempts at speaking Spanish in my previous works. It, yeah, I get a lot of comments about that. <laughs> now, as previously mentioned, Montcalm held little to no respect for French colonialists and in no way for his native allies. The idea that he would be speaking directly to Magua, all buddy-buddy like this, is ridiculous. And Magua is speaking for all 30 tribes as if he kind of controls them or something. Doesn't make any sense. It's it's all quite ridiculous. Now the courier from Monreal is going to try and escape the fort, where Hawkeye and Uncas literally snipe a few guys down using muskets like they're Davy Crockett or something. Oh, and Hawkeye finally gets it on Wakora, and that gets imprisoned. Uh, tough luck. So the siege is getting more intense, and Monroe says the French are digging closer and closer every day, and they'll be within 200 yards soon, a range upon they can use the 15-inch motors. This is shown in the film, it's pretty awesome. They lob explosive rounds over the walls, dealing tons of damage, which is what occurred historically. Monroe helplessly watched every day as the French dug closer to the fort, bringing his doom. And then he learned that Webb was not coming to save them. Here we get the surrender scene, which is perfect. If you do not know about this time period, this is the age of gentry, where war was fought like a royal banquet or something. And Montcalm is famously known for being one of the most gentleman-like figures, often exaggerating and being flamboyant. The terms given in the film are the same as they were in history, that the British and their camp followers would be allowed to withdraw under French escort to Fort Edward with the full honors of war, on the condition that they refrain from fighting for 18 months. They were allowed to keep their muskets, a symbolic cannon, uh, but no ammunition. In addition, British authorities were to release French prisoners within three months. 
While the surrender scene was done perfectly in the film, the next part is utterly wrong. Yes, I know my part in this review is already over, but I really have to f just throw my two cents in here. In the real history, Montcalm, before agreeing to the terms of surrender, specifically spoke to his native allies to make sure they understood the terms and that the chiefs would restrain their men. Montcalm completely failed to understand his native allies' culture and the reason for their fighting. Not only did the chiefs not have the power to control their men, the natives had legitimate grievances against the redcoats. The natives also believed that they were being thwarted their right to plunder, scalp, and take prisoners. So the natives, feeling slighted, took matters into their own hands. It's not shown in the film, but the actual Fort William Henry Massacre, as it's called by some, occurred immediately when 450 British troops were ordered to abandon the fort and join their comrades in a nearby encampment. Upon doing so, the natives slipped past, ran into the fort to plunder, finding the wounded and sick still inside. They killed 30, wounded 40, taking scalps and plunder. After this, they went to a nearby cemetery and began digging corpses for war trophies, particularly for the redcoats. If you recall one of the quotes I said from Montcalm about finding the bodies behind the fort, this is really evident of his character. The massacre as I will describe, ruined the small relationship Montcalm had with his native allies. The entire thing disgusted him. As a result of the fort being plundered, Montcalm spoke directly with Monroe to devise a plan to march the British safely out uh, somewhere around 12 o'clock at midnight to prevent a massacre. Unfortunately, when they tried to do this, the natives were fully ready. Thus, Monroe and Montcalm decided it was best to try and march out 5 a.m. the next day. So, at 5 a.m., with French escorts, the fort's garrisons made their march. However, the natives were ready for this. While the British regulars were comparatively lucky, few having been stripped of their outer clothing and possessions, the rear of the march was not so lucky. The colonial militia in the back were attacked maliciously as the French escorts tried to stop the natives. The British native allies were literally all just dragged off. American, African Americans were claimed as property by the natives, and then they gave a hell whoop, signaling for the massacre to take place. Tomahawks tore skulls, and the killing went on for just minutes, but it was especially horrible. Montcalm was made aware of the massacre, but was too late to help, even though he personally intervened to recover prisoners who were taken by the natives later on. Many French officers did the same. One actually rescued a British officer named Adam Williamson, who was found naked running. Back at Fort William Henry, Monroe and 500 garrison soldiers and their wives were ransomed, and Montcalm was shamed greatly by this event. And it marked the time when he finally decided he was never going to use native allies again if he could, which arguably led him to losing the war for Nouvelle France. Historian Ian Steele put the massacre figures around 200 of the 2,308 who marched, being killed or wounded. Some historians have boasted figures up to 1,500, uh, but a lot of these are contemporary propagandist pieces trying to raise the war effort against Nouvelle France at the time. Just to reiterate, Monroe was not killed during this massacre, and I don't know why the film portrayed this, I guess they just needed a little bit of extra vigor. Anyways, to finish up, as to why I'm even talking about this massacre, it's not part of my review. It's because the film goes on to show a scene where Montcalm tells Magua to perform the massacre. This is ridiculous when you consider the real history. I guess they just really need to vilify someone in this movie. But the idea of Montcalm being the one responsible for this massacre telling the natives to do so is utterly ridiculous. It was the thing that ruined his entire career. He was trying to thwart this at all costs. Uh, but anyways, it's now time for me to shut up and for, for Jake C to be taking over and doing the second half of the review. Take it away. Here we have all